The reason you see all of this lush vegetation behind me in the middle of February is because I'm speaking to you from Perth, which is located in Western Australia. Uh, this is about the farthest place from New York I could possibly be. New York is where my wife and I normally live. And um, I feel very fortunate to be here in the land where ketchup is called tomato sauce and sprinkles are actually called, believe it or not, hundreds and thousands. Um, I hope all of you in the colder regions of the world can vicariously enjoy this warm weather through me. Um, it has been an incredibly challenging year for all of us and I sincerely hope that you and your loved ones are safe and sound during these difficult times. Uh, I, like you and everyone else, very much look forward to the day that COVID-19 is finally under control. Uh, before I go on, I want to acknowledge the Noongar people. Uh, they are the owners of country throughout this part of Australia. And I recognize their continuing connection to the land, the waters, and the culture. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I would also like to address the circumstances that led to the birth of the music I will be discussing today. Uh, that's blues, ragtime, and jazz. All came from a lineage of enslaved human beings who were forcibly removed from their homes and stripped of their liberty for hundreds of years throughout the Americas. Uh, this music is very sacred to me, and it is important that we acknowledge and always remember the dreadful reality of its origins. It is our musical community's responsibility to spread the love that we share for this art form and to celebrate all of its spiritual properties. So, without uh, further ado, let's go on to the topic at hand, which is uh, developing a voice and different approaches of self-teaching. All right, so I'll give a brief overview of what we're gonna discuss. Uh, the first one is self-examination with an honest and proactive attitude. The second one is discipline and perseverance. The third one, which is my favorite, deciphering the magic of sound and music. And the fourth, finally, is self-teaching. The more technical musical examples will, will occur in the second half of this presentation. Uh, but first I wanna focus on self-examination. Uh, oftentimes, we are so caught up with being able to play our instruments or being able to understand harmony and develop our ears that we overlook what I think is the most important thing, which is who we are and what we have to offer as members of society and artists. Uh, by the way, these are not intended to be rhetorical questions. I encourage you to get out a pen and paper or your phone or whatever you use and actually write down the answers to these questions that I'm about to pose. So, firstly, who are you as a human being? Lighthearted question, right? Uh, <laughs> in an attempt to answer this question, history has shown us that human beings are capable of everything from the most rhapsodic, joyous things to the most catastrophic events, all in an effort to solidify ideologies of perceived self-identity. So I think it's essential that as artists, you at the very least reflect on who you are, or alternatively, if we're in Australia, <laughs> there's a lot of beautiful parents. Uh, so alternatively, I would say, if you, if you can't answer the question of who you are as a human being, maybe try answering who you're not. Uh, yeah, uh, it's impossible to answer that question in my opinion, but it's completely uh, a worthwhile endeavor to at least try to answer the question. Always ask the question at the very least. Okay, the second thing in this category what are your aesthetic preferences? And I can make an analogy to food. So I'm not talking about who your favorite cook is. I'm asking you what your favorite food is. A good way to get in touch with that, uh, your aesthetics, is to use an emotion circle. You can look this up online or make up your own. I put one on the screen here so you can see what I mean. Uh, just next time you listen to music, just have an emotion circle in front of you and listen to the music actively. I think in this day and age, the majority of quote unquote music listening is very passive. So it's important that we can get in touch with what it's doing to us emotionally and hopefully viscerally. Of course, the reason that we are musicians is so that we don't have to put sounds into words. We use sound and music so that we can express all of those abstract emotions that we're feeling. But at, again, I think that it's a very worthwhile thing to do so that we can at least get closer to having a clarity in our mind of, of what it is that we're perceiving as emotion. All right, the next thing is unit versus, versus universe. And um, so th this is the Latin, 
the Latin uh, root of both of these words is similar. So unit is uh, uni, which means one, and then universe, it's universum, which means combined into one, into a whole. This just uh, refers to who you are as a person. Um, in addition to analyzing who you are, I highly encourage you to look around and see where you feel you fit into the universe, into society. Most of us are a product of our time, and boy oh boy are these times that we're living now in, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of music in there that we can make. Uh, next we're going to discuss how clearly can you put into words why it is that you play and compose music. Uh, so let's discuss something, uh, th these two approaches to, to music. There's absolute music and programmatic music. Absolute music, it's just music for music's sake. It's just sound. It's uh, embracing that it's just vibrations and that they enter our eardrum and we interpret them with our hearts. Uh, that's just music for music's sake. I don't want to say just music for music's sake, but it's different from programmatic music in that programmatic music is about a specific emotion or a specific event, an idea, a concept, something that we relate to uh, besides music. It, it's just a, a human uh, existence sort of thing that we can all relate to. For me personally, I tend to gravitate towards programmatic music. Actually, one of the reasons I'm shooting this video outside, surrounded uh, by nature, is because I feel a very strong connection to, to the living world. Uh, it's, it's a term that's used to describe that is biophilia. You may have heard of my label, Biophilia Records, but that's a different topic. Um, I completely am down for music, for music's sake, but nature has played a, a pretty big role in why I play music. It's not the only reason why I play it obviously but it it is something that makes me happy and joyous and I want to share it with the world those are Australian Ravens you're hearing in the background by the way they sound very different from American Ravens okay so this is another one that as as you get older uh, becomes very important how do you keep the flame alive in the face of challenges and obstacles so uh, I want to show you this clip by uh, that features a journalist called Chris Hedges and uh, it deals with having the courage to stay true to your voice. Check it out. Just, um, I mean, what price do you think you've paid? I don't think I paid a price. I think I would have paid a price for staying in. I wouldn't have been able to live with myself. Um, you know, I was pushed out of the New York Times because I was publicly denouncing the invasion of Iraq. And uh, again, it comes down to that necessity to speak a truth, or at least the truth as far as you can discern it. I spent months of my life in Iraq. I know the instrument of war. Uh, I understood on many ways, in, in all the ways that this was going to be a disaster. Mm -hmm. To remain silent would have been the price. Um, was it good for my career? Well, of course not, but my career was never the point. I didn't go to I didn't drive down Mount Igman into Sarajevo when it was being hit with 2,000 shells a day because it was good for my career. Uh, I went there because what was happening was a crime against humanity. And as a reporter, I wanted to be there to chronicle it. But do you think you can accomplish more as a dissenter than as a journalist? Yeah, I, it's not a question that I've asked. Um, it's the, because the question is, what, what do you have to do? Um, I certainly knew after 15 years at the New York Times that running around on national television shows denouncing the war in Iraq was, uh, as a news reporter, was uh, tantamount to career suicide. I mean, I was aware of that. For those who seek the moral life, there will always come a time in which they have to defy even institutions they care about if they are to able to retain that moral core. Uh, and in essence, what you know, the New York Times or other institutions were asking is that I muzzle myself. But all institutions do that, don't they? All institutions do. Intuitively or in explicitly? That's right. And, and I think for those of us who care about speaking, uh, you know, the truth, you know, or, or, or if you want to call it dissent, uh, we, are, we are going to have to accept that, that is, at one day there's going to probably mean a clash with the very institutions 
that have nurtured and supported us. And I have been nurtured and supported by these institutions. So, as you can tell, he had conviction. He felt he had agency. So he followed his voice. He followed his gut. And as artists, as musicians, composers, improvisers, if you're really following your gut, there's going to come a point where people will not like what you're doing. As a matter of fact, you might not like what you're doing. But you have to absolutely continue. Uh, you have to follow your gut. You have to stay true to what resonates with you because you are the only one that can share with the world what's unique about you. And that is not a lie. <laughs> That's a fact. Okay, the next thing. Uh, what music have you heard that most resonates you and your emotions as it relates to the highest highs that you've experienced and the lowest lows? So to clarify, another way that I could ask this is on your deathbed, in your funeral, what music do you want to be played? Uh, at your wedding, what music do you want to be played? At your child's birth, what music do you want to be played? Those are very important moments in our lives and I know for me, uh, Ravel's Piano Concerto Second Movement in my funeral. As a matter of fact, <laughs> during the recent birth of my son, I, I played that for my wife, the Ravel Piano Concerto Second Movement. I have studied that piece a million times. I've analyzed it, I've, but we will get to that part of the masterclass later. This next one might be a trigger uh, but I, I think it's very important that we address it, and it is, do you have control issues? <laughs> um, this art form requires us to have the ability to simultaneously be able to let go, completely let go of control, and on the other hand, we have to be in control of the situation, complete control. Uh, an instance of this is if you bring in a composition to a group of, of people that you feel they are playing your music not at all in line with what you were imagining. Granted, there are exceptions. If they're messing up your music, that, that's a whole different story. But that's a situation where I, I would say for in the majority of the time, you have to let go of control. You have to let the music be what it is. You have to respect the musicians that are playing your music because they have a story to tell as well. So that that's a situation where you absolutely have to be at peace with yourself so that you can let go of controlling things. Um, another situation, let's say that you're playing a tune and things get really crazy and you lose track of the form or somebody else loses track of the form. You have to be able in that situation to choose whether you're going to take control or not take control. And again, you have to be at peace with yourself. There's, there's a lot of... Uh, baggage that comes along with that. Um, many times uh, control issues have to do with, with trauma. Um, I personally have zero stigmas with mental health and I highly recommend a book that was very helpful to me that's called The Body Keeps the Score. Um, I, it, it's a very personal, individual thing for, for people and I respect that. Uh, I am just trying to do the best that I can to help you uh, through sharing what has helped me. Okay, the next thing. How do you handle fear or pressure? You know, that has a lot to do with what we just spoke about. Uh, in my mind, um, fear can, can hinder development if, if it means that you take yourself out of situations where you could possibly fail. It's very important to fail. It's probably more important to fail than it is to succeed because it's in, in your failures or whatever you perceive as a failure that you have actually succeeded because you had the courage to put yourself in a situation that you knew could ultimately embarrass the hell out of you. And what you have to do when that happens is just go home, reflect on what happened, and try to improve on it. That That's... Uh, one of the best uh, scenarios you could possibly have uh, because it'll lead to growth, I, I, I guarantee it. Uh, this next question is, who do you admire and why? It's a pretty self-explanatory question. 
Uh, but a little bit of advice on the not so good aspects of possibly idolizing your your people that you really admire as musicians. Um, stay true to yourself. Be yourself. Yes, there are plenty of people that are doing amazing things, uh, but I just think it's it's best if you are able to admire and respect that. Uh, and still be able to have your own space, your own identity. I, I don't think there's a need to idolize. Um, okay, so the next uh, big topic, which is discipline and perseverance. And again, we're going to get to the musical examples pretty soon. So in academia, we can get into all of these lofty concepts and flowery language about art and everything, but the bottom line, if you really want to grow, you have to be true to yourself. You have to be honest with yourself. And just ask very basic questions like, what are you good at? What are you bad at? Period. End of story. Write it down. <laughs> That's it. I have no more to say on that. You just have to be honest with yourself and, and know where you're at. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing is perseverance. Um, I, would, I would ask you, how comfortable are you with spending countless hours working on a single sonic or musical skill or passage or concept? Um, Trust me, there are no shortcuts in this art form. It takes discipline and a lot of time to reach your goals. Um, are you able to have the resilience to keep working on something for what may take years before you notice any improvements as far as playing on your instrument or, or composing or improvising? That, that's a real important question to come to terms with because it's the reality of it. Uh, when we first start improvising or, or playing an instrument, it seems like we're growing very quickly because we make uh, leaps and bounds. But as you develop, uh, things get way more intricate and there's a lot more nuance to growth. So that's where you know the patience and the perseverance has to kick in. Okay, so are you the type of person that works best with a concrete schedule which outlines all the exact times and durations of what you're going to work on? I tried that. I'm personally not uh, a candidate for that, <laughs> I've learned. So the next question is, are you someone who thrives with lists? Um, I absolutely uh, gravitate more towards having lists. It, it makes me <laughs> what I call a productive procrastinator. Uh, it's, it's very easy for me if there's something I want to work on musically, if there's uh, anybody's music that I, I want to put under the microscope and really understand what's going on, I'll just write it down on my list of things that I want to do. There's no time, uh, there, there's no sort of schedule of when it's going to get done. I just have that list there ready for me when I feel like it's time to work on stuff. And if there's something in that list that's a little intimidating, that's where the productive procrastination kicks in. I can just pick up on something else that's not as daunting and I'm still progressing, I'm still moving forward. All right, so the next thing is, and this is a very important one, do you practice away from your instrument? Um, I, I think it's very important to realize that what we do is not your typical nine to five job. Uh, we, the, the music is what we play literally the word play, we, we have fun with it, and, and it is a very uh, serious craft that we, that we respect and admire, and there's a tradition to it. Uh, if, if you spend the entire day not thinking about your instrument, not thinking about music, and then expect to sit down and practice for two, four hours, and then that's where all of the progress is going to happen, I hate to break it to you, but you are mistaken. <laughs> uh, we, we have to engage with everything that we're trying to grow uh, towards throughout the day. I mean, you don't have to get psychotic and every second of the day be thinking scales, be hearing chords. But, you know, just every once in a while, if you're a visual person, you play the piano, you can, you can visualize a harmony or chords that you're working on. Um, you know, rhythms. You've all seen the, the crazy musicians in the subway that look like... Uh, they're off in another universe and we're just tapping rhythms. It's great to do that. Um, if, if you're more of an aural person, go for it. Sing in your head up or out loud. That happens plenty in my neighborhood with a lot of people. Uh, you know, nobody's expecting you to be a Mozart genius that can just 
hear the entire orchestra in, in your head and write it all out. But, you know, get the neurons connected in your head away from the instrument. It'll, it'll help you in the long run. The next thing that we're going to discuss is the value of keeping a notebook. Out of everything that I've spoken about so far, if, if, you get, if you take away anything from this presentation, it's how helpful it can be to have a notebook. Um, I'm in Australia now, so I wasn't able to bring all of my notebooks, but throughout the years, I've kept many notebooks um, just full of concepts, ideas, uh, just... This is basically uh, my voice. If we're talking about self-teaching and developing a voice, this is it. This is who I am in these notebooks. Uh, this is from 2008 and 2009. This is from 2007 and 2008. Um, yeah, I can't uh, recommend enough that you get yourself a music notebook and use it to self-teach. And I'll, I'll go more into detail uh, in exactly how, to, how I do that and how you could do that. So next is deciphering the magic of sound. And I really do think it's magical. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. So, Put everything under the microscope. Leave no deep detail left unexamined, which is exactly what I do in these notebooks. Uh, musical elements found throughout a wide spectrum of cultures include the same things, pretty much. You have melody, uh, rhythm, pulse slash tempo, instrumentation, dynamics, harmony, flux and flow slash form, harmonic rhythm, counterpoint, sonic density, electricity, which is mean, you know, electronic music, electronic aspects. And then lyrics, which, you know, are songs, poetry, that sort of thing. I'll discuss more in depth how I examine those in these notebooks coming up. The next thing is technique. Um, in order to free your imagination, you have to condition your body, the, the mechanics of producing sound for whichever instrument you play, or compositional techniques even, or sound production. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it'll free your imagination if, if you're not limited by by your physical body uh, I have been very fortunate throughout my life to have had the guidance of incredible musicians uh, there's somebody who I always pay homage to which is Conchita Betancourt uh, not to get off on a tangent but I, I was born in Cuba and uh, we crossed the border from Mexico to Texas and arrived at the United States with no money my parents uh, I come from a very poor family and there is a woman whose name is Conchita Betancourt who out of the goodness of her heart uh, decided that she wanted to help me and she gave me piano lessons completely free of charge for three years until I could audition um, to go to a New World School of the Arts in, in Miami. And Conchita instilled in me this sort of uh, admiration for, for, the, for the mechanics, the technical aspects of of playing this instrument. I, I have a deep respect for the, for the tradition of, of, of classical piano, uh, jazz piano, just the, the, the technical aspects of it. it it's, it's an amazing instrument and our, and our bodies are incredible. Uh, thank you, Conchita. Always, forever, thank you. I owe you everything. <laughs> um, there's also these exercises called the Philippe exercises, which were uh, taught to me by another wonderful woman whose name is Peggy Irwin. She could trace her lineage back to Chopin. And the Philippe exercises are all based on diminished chords and it's, it's to develop your uh, independence of the fingers and strength. So it sounds something like, this is just one example. It's quite, it's quite the workout. And anybody out there who hasn't done the Philippe exercises Take it slowly at first, because you, you can sort of injure yourself. It's, it's, it's intense exercises. Um, the, I'm speaking about technique because it's a reality of what we do. Again, we can talk in lofty, you know, flowery terms about everything, but the reality is that we are physical beings and we don't want to injure ourselves. We want to continue playing this music, so make sure that you pay attention to proper technique. Simple as that. Um, okay, so... The next topic, and I'm not saying this to be funny or anything, but learn like a baby. 
have an open-minded approach to music in the same way that babies are able to figure out the world around them without having any concept of what a vocabulary vocabulary is or a language uh, we as musicians we have we can let go of everything we think we know and just explore and play within a stimulating sonic environment uh, we spoke about this earlier the topic of controlling or not controlling situations I, I believe that in order to truly be able to improvise you have to let go of the need to understand and control things from time to time so yeah learn like a baby learn from your mistakes um, Miles Davis is quoted for saying that there are no wrong notes in jazz now with all due respect that statement is in my opinion which is just that my opinion neither completely right nor completely wrong uh, I think it's a matter of context and that is an important distinction that some musicians may and again this is in my humble opinion uh, overlook or they're just blissfully unaware which I wish I could be uh, everything in music is framed within the context that it exists in uh, in the same way that there are that there's generally a basic universal morality that we acknowledge as a species regardless of our religion or culture um, there's a framework or a culturally acknowledged and accepted canon within different styles of jazz uh, or improvised music that can be easily identified if you allow yourself to get intimate with it uh, there are absolutely exceptions to all of these rules but I think that it is good to be aware of, of the quote-unquote rules and traditions so that you can be empowered to make musical decisions that will in turn uh, have real substantial depth to them. So in conclusion, there are no wrong notes and there absolutely definitely are very wrong notes. <laughs> this contradiction actually leads me to my next point, which is if you're an artist, if you're a musician, you have to be at home with the irrational. Uh, the inexplicable and the abstract. Uh, all words are made up. Music theory is exactly that, a theory. Be a baby. <laughs> yeah. So next is finally get to self-teaching. And I'm going to discuss now sources. Okay, so are you going to specialize in a single approach or role model? Um, are you going to embrace a wide spectrum of genres and traditions? Well, a monoculture is the cultivation of a single crop in a given area. Do you, and I, am, I ask this seriously, do you want your musical mind to look like this or to look like this? I completely respect if you gravitate towards the monoculture. It is completely valid to dedicate yourself to one thing only if it is truly something that resonates with you and you have a sincere sense of conviction. All the power to you. After all, isn't that essentially what a PhD thesis is all about? Learning absolutely everything there is to know about a very specific uh, part of something. Now having said that, I myself am more of an untamed wild nature rather than monoculture sort of person. I am at peace with being a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, I find that incredibly uh, fulfilling. So in the spirit of polyculture, let's spin <laughs> this wheel of musical elements uh, and put things under the microscope. Uh, there's a bunch of artists here, and so let's just understand what the quote-unquote magic and ingredients are that resonate with us so much. So, without further ado, let's spin this wheel. Bam. Awesome. So we, la we landed on KRS-One. Uh, I lived in the Bronx for a while, so uh, that's... This music is, is special to me, uh, and honestly... Um, this album, I think, is very relevant to the times that we're living in right now. N not just because of the pandemic, but the, the I Can't Breathe and Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I, I recommend that you listen to this album. I think it's uh, un unbelievable. So let's, let's just put it under the microscope. Let's put uh, I Woke Up. Now help me out, what's this all about? What's this condition? I gotta figure out Am I really out? That I really doubt Give me the remedy, what is the amount? Whatever you telling me, selling me, compelling me You're the light in me ain't out Anyway, I enter cats, remember knowledge I sent you forever, they shout South Bronx, South Bronx, South Bronx, South Bronx Then I woke up This is hip-hop, it's, it's not This particular example isn't uh, Very melodious, it's, it's rap So, okay Now let's go to rhythm 
or pulse. Uh, this is in 6 8. Instrumentation. This is where it starts getting really cool. So we have you know, voice, uh, what sounds to me like nylon string guitar, drum machine, claps, kick drum, snare, snaps, piano, bass synth, and then a fiber slide. Anyway, I enter cast, remember knowledge, I sent you forever, they shout. South Bronx, South Bronx, South Bronx, South Bronx. The next element is dynamics and loud. Uh, harmonic queen, it just goes from the five to the one, uh, as far as chord. Um, harmonic rhythm, so basically what's happening is it's a phrase two, two bars long in 6-8. Counterpoint, uh, because this is hip hop and there's a lot of sampling, uh, there is counterpoint. It's however not the counterpoint that you would assume that you would connect with Bach or something like that, Baroque style. And then so the sonic density, uh, it might sound dense, but if you really look at the the pitch material, you really have two, three-ish voices here. And now what I've spoken about before, electricity, so electronic music. Now here's where, for me, it gets really cool. So sonically, if you listen to it, the KRS-1's voice is being panned and it's been run through effects. Uh, the guitar is actually a sample from a movie soundtrack uh, of uh, a movie from the 90s called De Peral, uh, which is Antonio Banderas. So to me, that's amazing. Uh, you have the Bronx meeting the South Bronx meeting Mexico through Hollywood. Um, you know, Mexico has an incredibly rich history of, of music as well, and the fact that they're merging together here, that, that's, to me, that, that's that magic that I'm talking about in music. Not to mention, uh, lyrically, the things that he's talking about. Uh, but beyond that, lyrically, uh, culturally, a uh, thing to me that really uh, immediately kind of popped out is that line where he's saying, whatever you're telling me, selling me, compelling me. Now, for all you out there that are kind of fascinated with rhythm, how I am, whatever you're telling me, selling me, compelling me, those are sevens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Whatever you're telling me, selling me, compelling me. So, uh, what did I do when I heard that? Um, I, at the time, I wasn't exactly sure why it kind of popped out at me so much. So, I went to my notebook. Let's see where it is, right here. I went to my notebook and I started trying to figure out what is it about this that resonates with me so much and I figured out it was the seven. That's the part, uh, you know, from a rhythmic, rhythmic aspect that was really hitting me. Whatever you're telling me, selling me, compelling me. So I turned it into exercises that I could then use in, in my own music. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. So if I were to give it a pulse with my left hand, it would sound like this. Right, and then I, that, then I, I ran with that and then just kept up, kept coming up with exercises. So, uh, the next one, instead of major chords. So I changed the, um, what do you call it, the inversion of it. And then, uh, then the direction of it changes. And lucky you, here are the parrots coming to roost. So we can just listen to them for a minute. Music. There's hundreds, hundreds of parrots that come here to roost. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you want to turn that into music, that'd be cool. All right, so, where was I? Seven. Okay, so another interesting thing about that particular seven is that it's not the same type of seven repeated twice. It's not one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and then again, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. It's actually one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. 
So. Doctor, help me out. What's this all about? What's this condition? I gotta figure out. Am I really out? That I really doubt. Give me the remedy. What is the amount? Whatever you telling me, selling me, compelling me, you're the light in me ain't out. Anyway, I enter cash. Remember knowledge. I sent you forever. They shout. South Bronx. South Bronx. South Bronx. South Bronx. Then I woke up. I took that and I wrote Russian Love Story, which is one of the, the uh, pieces from my first album. And that goes... The first measure is a straight 4 plus 3, and the second measure is a 3 plus 4. It might sound crazy that this music that I just played for you is a direct result of me listening to a KRS album called Life where he combines his experience uh, with Mexican music from an Antonio Banderas movie. I think that's amazing. I, I love the way that's, that's all connected. All right, so let's discuss tools available for us today. I think there's a lot of information that, that you can get from learning standards as, as far as compositional ideas, uh, melodic development as an improviser, all sorts of things. So I use Ableton Live to, to have almost like a musical spreadsheet where I have different versions of the same standard sang by different singers. And it's specifically singers because if, if you learn a, a standard from let's say Sonny Rollins yeah, uh, Sonny sounds great, uh, but he's interpreting the melody in his own way. So if you really want to know the, the melody, if you want to know what the song is about, uh, then you know, learn it from, from singers' interpretations. Uh, there are the benefits to doing it with Ableton, and uh, there's a bunch of other tools available, apps, things like that, is that I can, I can slow it down, I can speed it up, I can have it in different keys. I can loop it in such a way where it's only the head of the, the tune that's being played over and over and over. So I can just play it over and over, uh, play along with it. Uh, there's this app on iPads or, or tablets called Fourscore that's amazing, especially you know back in the day when, when I was touring. Uh, I, I could take a bunch of classical music. To this day, I still practice Chopin etudes and on sound checks and stuff, I could just you know, learn new Chopin etudes on Fourscore. Also, there's this person that I went to school with at Manhattan School of Music. I'm going to give him a plug now because I think he made an incredible app, which is called Metronomics, and that is John Nastos. Uh, this is a great metronome because essentially you can turn it into a, a very uh, specific uh, metronome that plays the entire form for multimeter uh, tunes that you might be working on, like modern music that your peers are composing or you're composing, that have different sections with different meters, uh, metric modulations, things like that. It, uh, metronomics has really helped me uh, in that regard. And I should say, uh, you know, these tools, they're training wheels. They're not intended to stay with you forever. You, nobody wants to ride a bike with training wheels forever. So, you know, keep that in mind. All right, so next, transposition. Let's uh, go back to the, the circle of artists and see who we land on, just so I can show you uh, the, the merit of transposition. The, the reason that transposition is so important is because we can get used to specific uh, key signatures and not really realize the connection of those pitches to the overall picture. Uh, when you're transposing, you're, you are turning on a part of your brain that's analyzing things in real time. So let's, let's take a composition like Sophisticated Lady. I think uh, it's a great example because of the bridge. Uh, melodically and harmonically, you, you know, you have to use your ears and really understand what's going on architecturally. So let's see, the original key for the bridge, uh, well, I don't know if it's the original one, but the most common one is an A flat major. So the first chord is B flat minor. I don't have 
the sustain pedal, just so you know. All right, so the bridge goes down a half step to G major. So yeah, that takes you on a journey. So what I would do is turn on my metronome and play in all 12 keys. Uh, no matter what, I wouldn't stop, I'd keep going. So let's just do, for example, in, in C major, uh, the first chord would be the two. And for the sake of time, now let's go to the bridge, which, if uh, we remember, it goes down a half step. And here's where you have to ear, you have to use your ear and also understand uh, architecturally what's going on. So. And then we're in, in C major, so we go back to uh, the, the two of C major. So that right there, that's where my ears were helping me, but I needed to really use both my ears and my understanding of harmony to get back to that center key. Okay, the next thing is hemiolus. Uh, rhythm is very uh, important. It can be very freeing. A hemiola or a, or a polymeter, uh, an example of that, let's say again with seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, so you keep a dotted quarter note in one hand and you do the, that pattern in the other one. So it sounds like... Line up after three bars. You can, I mean, the, the possibilities are endless with this and it'll really free up your sort of rhythmic um, abilities. I figured this was a good moment for you to view the overall picture of everything that we've discussed. Before ending the presentation, I wanted to mention a couple of other concepts that I think are vital to our development as artists and musicians. The first one is the idea of downbeats versus upbeats. I feel that uh, it is upbeats that really determine our pulse and our feel. Uh, if you dedicate time with the metronome, to really being ultra conscious of where your upbeat sits. I think you'll find that all of a sudden playing music will be more conducive to subtle rhythmic nuance. You know, I feel that I am guilty of not pushing myself enough during the pandemic to put myself in situations where I sight read more often. I feel like sight reading is very similar to transposing in that you have to engage your brain in analyzing the moment quickly. You have to be present and you have to process information very rapidly. The last thing that I wanted to do was to leave you with two passages that I think really capture the spirit of finding your own individual voice. The first one is by A.R. Amons. It's a poem entitled Poetics and it says, I look for the way things will turn out spiraling from a center, the shape things will take to come forth in, so that the birch tree white touched black at branches will stand out wind glittering totally its apparent self. I look for the forms things want to come as from the black wells of possibility, how a thing will unfold. Not the shape on paper, though that too, but the uninterfering means on paper. Not so much looking for the shape as being available to any shape that may be summoning itself through me from the self not mine but ours. The second passage is a letter that Martha Graham wrote to a student and it says, there is a vitality, a life force, an energy, a quickening that is translated through you into action and because there is only one of you in all of time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and it will be lost. The world will not have it. It is not your business to determine how good it is, nor how valuable, nor how it compares with other expressions. It is your business to keep it yours clearly and directly, to keep the channel open. You do not even have to believe in yourself or your work. 
You have to keep yourself open and aware to the urges that motivate you. Keep the channel open. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best.